Do you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you the CEO and co-founder of Fitness Genes, Dr. Dan Reardon. You feel out of balance in your life, like your family and your work are your priorities, but you don't have enough time in the day, so you're shortchanging them both, not to mention wanting to work out more or, or do more of the things that you love. Are you easily distracted and you want to be able to stay more focused so you can lock in on the most important things that you know you should be doing? You want to be more consistent so you can achieve those goals that always seem just out of reach. Or maybe you feel like you just lack the motivation that it takes to get there. Or maybe you're just not clear on what the right first step actually is. Like every time you're about to take action, you doubt whether or not it's the right action or the right goal. I know the feeling. I've got a wife and four kids, I have a job, a rental property, this podcast, not to mention the inevitable challenges that just come up with life like you know illness and struggling family members or car trouble. I've got a lot going on. But when I was a Division I All-American athlete, I was completely locked in. I was focused. I was balanced. And I knew exactly what I wanted and the steps that I had to take to get it. But when I got into the real world, things got a lot more complex. There's just a lot more time demands. Like everything seems to be a priority. How are you supposed to figure out what's the right next step for you? Well, I've developed a system that helps you do just that. Find the balance, the clarity, the focus that you're looking for so you can take your life to the next level. So you can start seeing the dreams that are in your mind as realistic goals and have a plan to achieve them. I've opened a few spots on my calendar for free 30-minute strategy calls so you can Take that first step toward the life that you've always dreamed about. Just one simple step, one small commitment that will give you huge results, a simple phone call that will leave you with a plan. If you want this life, if you want to truly have a breakthrough, claim one of the few spots open on my calendar and I'll share with you the formula that has had people who I work with saying things like one of my recent coaching clients, Frank, who said, my only regret is that I didn't do this 20 years ago. Or like Isaac who said, I love this version of myself the best and I'll do anything to keep it going. I've got dozens more quotes like that. If you want to feel the same way, go to jimharshawjr.com slash apply. That's jimharshawjr.com slash apply. Fitness Genes is the first DNA testing platform of its kind to eliminate guesswork from fitness and nutrition. With a simple DNA test, their team of genetic scientists reveal specific traits including metabolic tendencies, dietary sensitivities, fat burning capacity, muscle type, recovery time, and more so that you can optimize your diet and workouts for maximum results. Dr. Dan Reardon is a medical doctor and genetics expert who has been featured in the New York Times and Men's Fitness and on Fox News, ABC News, Inside Edition, The Today Show, and BBC News, an emergency room doctor for 10 years. He's also a certified personal trainer with more than 15 years of experience, and he's written two books, and he was formerly the science editor of Muscle and Fitness in Flex Magazine. So he's got the background, he's got the knowledge, he's got the experience, and today... He's going to share with us how our genes impact our diet and our fitness and what you can do about it. He's going to take the guesswork out of that. And he's also going to read the results of my own DNA test to tell me how my genes impact my health. So I'm not sure exactly how this is going to go. I'm not sure what's going to be revealed on this, but uh, we shall find out. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm part caveman or something like that. So we'll find out. And as usual for the listener, if you don't have time to listen to the entire episode or if you hear something you like but you don't have a chance to write it down, make sure you grab your free copy of The Action Plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Dr. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having me on the show. Great, great to be here. Well, this is really interesting because back in episode 121, 
Uh, I, I spoke with Dr. Sharad Paul, and we talked a little bit about optimizing your optimizing for success by eating for a gene type. But we really didn't go into the details of how you actually go about that. And we're going to learn more about that specifically from you today. But also, uh, you have a company where where you can actually get the results, right? Which I'm really excited to learn about my own results. And for the listener, you're going to understand how how somebody like me or like you can actually get these results. And he's going to tell us how you can do that, but also what they mean to you and kind of the, learn about the feedback that you can get so that you can actually optimize your diet, optimize your workouts so that so that you can be the optimal human being that uh, I know you want to be. So Dr. Dan, let's start with this. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. Give us sort of a 30,000 foot view of, of your background. Where'd you grow up and sort of how'd you get from there to here? Yeah, so I come from a very athletic family. My dad was a semi-professional footballer, so always been brought up around sport and taken a keen interest in being fit and active. And um, I was a, originally a 400 meter runner, but I got injured at university. So when I started medical school, I got injured and then ultimately made the decision that I wanted to, rather than go into coaching athletics, I wanted to train as a personal trainer because, you know, really interesting sort of keeping fit and in shape. I then started a, a personal training business at medical school, opened a personal training studio. And when I graduated in 2004, I sold that business and then pursued a career as a medical doctor where my focus, or my special, where I specialize in emergency medicine. I did some trauma and orthopedics, some plastic surgery, and a few other, a few other surgical specialties. In the time I was a doctor, I also um, uh, maintained my interest in fitness and nutrition. As you mentioned, I was a science editor in Muslim Fitness Magazine. Uh, I wrote two books for Weed Publishing. And it was ultimately... I guess the question I always used to hear in sports and always used to hear in fitness was when people would always refer to people's genetics being the reason that they were good at something. And the problem is that as a statement had no context. And I remember always thinking to myself, wow, it'd be so great to actually have some context to that question and be able to give some, you know, some grit to the answer. And in 2011, my best friend or one of my best friends, Dr. Stuart Grice, who is a PhD geneticist at Oxford University, he started talking to me about some gene variations that were prevalent in certain types of athletes. And it was kind of from that point on that, you know, really, um, you know, started with this idea of being able to personalize people's workouts and nutrition plans using genetics. So I think that I'm kind of one of these people that, you know, I've always had this view that preventative health and preventative medicine and all that sort of stuff is, is really the way forward. And, it's really the way that we're going to have the biggest impact on the state of the health of the nation. And, uh, and it's kind of from that sort of, uh, I guess, internal belief that everything I was ever going to do in my life was always going to lead to a point in time when I would do, be doing something significant to try and tackle the problems that society has with regards to increasing rates of obesity, lifestyle-related um, conditions, high blood pressure, diabetes, all these sorts of things that, you know, I've kind of uh, you know, stayed on that path and it kind of brings me to where I am today. So, you know, not only do I get to work with professional athletes and sports teams, you know, with regards to how they can optimize their performance using genetic testing and, you know, all of that sort of stuff, but also the majority of my time is spent actually, you know, where I would like to think having an impact on people's ability to get healthy and hopefully prevent disease long term by exercising in the right way, eating in the right way based on genetics. So why is this important? I mean, I live a healthy lifestyle. Uh, I, I eat well. I feel like I eat right. I work out. What, what, can I, what might I discover here? What, uh, what might change for, for somebody like me or, or for anybody else for that matter? Why, why is this important? Well, I think there's, there's, there's sort of, to, well, there's, I guess there's three answers, actually. Um, the first answer is, why is it important? Well, frankly, not a lot else is working on a population perspective at the minute. You know, we're, it's predicted that by 2025, there's going to be about two and a half billion obese people in the world. So for all of the diets, all of the supplements, all of the, you know, magic apps, fitness apps, all these sorts of things that exist, actually the impact on society is, is very very low because the the numbers of the rates of obesity, type two diabetes, all these sorts of things are going up. So 
at a population scale, that's why it's important. On an individual scale, if you're a professional athlete, for example, well, all professional athletes are looking for that extra 0.1 of a percent in performance, whether it's uh, sprint time, whether it's throwing distance, whether it's power, lifting of the weight, whatever it is, they're looking for that 0.1%. And any additional pieces of data that they can use to get that 0.1% becomes incredibly important. Um, and for people that are just have an interest in fitness and, and, you know, generally stay in shape and eat right anyway, well, again, it's the thing of just finding out those additional tools that can help them hack their physical performance just a little bit more, whether it's establishing that they can manage a little bit more training volume, a little bit less rest, whether it's uh, actually a better understanding of their ability to resist fatigue and therefore how that might influence the structure of workouts, whether it's specific dietary supplements that they've never thought about taking that actually could be something that could be beneficial or they're taking something that they don't need to be taking. So it's, there's lots of reasons why it's important and really the level of importance is driven by the person that I'm talking to. Yeah, and a lot of the, a lot of the listeners are are not professional athletes. A lot were athletes at some point in their lives. And, uh, and, uh, you know, probably a, a fair amount of others were, were never athletes and, but they're just looking to optimize their performance today. Right. Uh, maybe yep. to be more present when they get home with their family, because maybe they're, you know, they're, they, they get the afternoon blahs. And by the time they get home from work, they're, they're stressed, they're frustrated, their their lack of focus, their mind's still at work. And, uh, and they want to be more focused. They want to be more present. Um, they don't want their head to be swimming, right? They want to, uh, get the most out of their workouts. Um, they want to, they want to sleep better. They want to maximize their time. You know, they, if they, um, if they're working out, they want to make sure they're doing the right workout. So is this, is this right for, for that type of person? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you think about, I mean, you know, the, the, what, what you've just described there is, is you know, classically sounds like quite a busy person who um, ultimately the, the, the way they're going to get the most out of their day is ensuring that they've got the right structure through the day. So they're waking up at the right time. They've got their priorities laid out. They're completing task after task. And where something like Fitness Dreams falls into that is for, for people who do require, who do need that sort of order because they're so busy well actually they need to know that they're doing the right type of workout they need to know that they're working out at the right time of the day they need to know that they're drinking their coffee at the right time that they're eating at the right time that they're having the right food at the right time so that all of these decision making processes if you like then something like fitness genes takes away the decision making process because it's like this is just what you have to do it's like you know Steve Jobs classically, you know, wore the same outfit every single day because he didn't want to have that process of having to make a decision on what to wear. Well, if you had a biological system such as fitness genes that can tell you exactly what your workout needs to be, exactly when you should be doing certain things, again, it's about if you're one of the, if you're the type of person that that has such a busy day that order and priority and all those sort of things are important. Well, removing that kind of decision-making process or removing the guesswork, if you like, becomes incredibly important. So for that person, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it, 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 it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You pretty much just nailed, nailed my listener. They want order. They want systems. They want proven processes. They want to know what time they should work out, when they should drink their coffee, what they should eat, et cetera. So I'm actually pretty excited. I'm getting more excited about this as, uh, as we go <laughs> along to hear about what time I should be working out, what co- when should I have my coffee, et cetera. Uh, and if I'm doing it all wrong or if I'm doing it kind of right or, or, or somewhere in between, what, yeah. what do you find, Dr. Dan, what, what do you find that most people are people are most surprised by what are the most sort of interesting and maybe shocking or surprising results that, that people hear or learn about? Well, I think, I think it, it, it often, it often depends. Um, and it depends on a number of things. So typically when people are engaged in fitness, um, they're never normally engaged in lots of things. They, they're normally just in very engaged in very specific things. So, you know, for example, it might be that you're very engaged in the idea of a keto diet or you're very engaged in CrossFit or you're very engaged in, you know, I don't know, weight training or, you know, whatever that specific thing is. And um, and, and their, their interest in that is generally, it's not biologically driven, it's driven by popularity, right? 
And the point that, or the most interesting thing that they find with our test is that we give them a tool that they don't have to be driven by popularity. They're actually driven by biology. So maybe they shouldn't be following a keto diet, even though they are. Maybe they should be following a keto diet. Maybe they shouldn't be doing, um, you know, high intensity training. Well, maybe they should be doing high intensity training. So it's where it's where what we tell them in some way contradicts what popularity is telling them, and that's often something that drives people's sort of you know really gauges their interest, especially you know for people that you know are sort of very um, uh, engaged, if you like, in the fitness world and understand there's lots of things. Um, and obviously, we give them the tools to be able to make better decisions. Cool. I'm I'm looking forward to this. So, uh, I, I I'm interested in the keto diet. As a matter of fact, I'm going to have for the listener. I'm going to have Drew Manning on the podcast again. I had him probably over a hundred episodes ago. I had Drew oh. on, but he's going to be on again talking about the keto diet. So, if you are interested in that, you can tune in in a few episodes after this one. But uh, it may not even be right for you. And it's going to be interesting to hear if that is, you know, whether or not that's right for me or if that's something that, uh, that, that we can find out through this today or not. But um, do you have any, Dr. Dan, do you have any case studies, any examples of people who got their DNA tests back and mm-hmm. they got one of your prescribed diets or prescribed workouts and you know, we're able to make significant change in their life and, and see, see significant results. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've got lots of examples and certainly, uh, you know, if you go on YouTube, for example, there's lots of, uh, you know, videos from people that have, you know, followed our plans and followed our workouts. Um, is that on your YouTube so the, channel? With a, do you guys uh, have a channel? Just, 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 just gem- yeah. I mean, we have a YouTube channel, but just generally on YouTube, if you type in fitness gene, you'll see, you know, all sorts of, you know, videos that have got, you know, tons and tons of views. Okay, um, so just for the listener, I'll, I'll just a quick mention yeah. for the listener, I'll, I'll grab some of those videos off of YouTube yeah. and I'll plug those into the action plan. So if you want to grab that, jimharshawjr.com slash action, and I'll have some of those uh, some of those YouTube videos that uh, Dr. Dan's referencing. But uh, but go ahead, sorry. Yeah, so, so broadly, I mean, you'll find people that, um, you know, have lost a whole bunch of weight that they've not been able to lose before. Or you'll get people whose levels of injury have reduced because they're actually not overtraining anymore. Or you'll get people who talk about, you know, better concentration and better energy levels through the day because they're not doing uh, the wrong types of things when it comes to their nutrition. Maybe for some people it's better sleep. Maybe for some people it's a bit more time with their family because they're not in the gym all the time. And there's, so there's, there's lots of kind of testimonials and different types of testimonials. Obviously, the most popular ones are the people who, who've lost a bunch of weight. But I mean, there's, there's, there's really, there's really all sorts of, you know, testimonials. And even from my perspective, I mean, I've, I've done five, four or five public transformations now using fitness genes products where I've either lost a whole bunch of body fat and got quite shredded or, you know, put on a bunch of weight and, you know, muscle and, you know, so there's, I mean, there's, there's lots and lots of, lots of, lots of uh, very positive stories. Awesome. So should we do this? Should we yeah, let's, do the let's big reveal it. of Jim's DNA Absolutely. test? Uh, so I, I, just to give you some context, my listeners are, you know, I kind of told you a little bit about who they are earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, they're, they're, some of the priorities that I have are really the same as my listeners. You know, I want to be more focused. I want to be, I want to maximize my productivity. I want to stay, I want to mm-hmm. be able to, have concentration, deeper focus, concentration for a longer time. I want to optimize my diet. I want to optimize my workouts. I want to optimize my life as much as I can so that I can maximize my impact on the world and mac you know in and, and, and achieve really I mean we're talking about achieving achieving what I know that I can achieve in the world and in maximizing my my potential. And that's just to kind of give you a frame of reference of, of where I'm coming from and I think where a lot of my listeners are coming from as well. Do you feel like there's an area at the moment that you're not particularly um, doing everything that you'd like to be doing in? Gosh. Um, in terms of, like, say, diet or fitness? Uh, diet, fitness. Um, or any of those things Daily living. Referencing. Yeah. Daily living. Um, any- Geez, I'm probably not sleeping enough. <laughs> uh, I okay. aim for about seven hours and 15 minutes, seven hours, seven and a half, se- between seven and seven and a half hours is what I aim for generally. Okay. Okay. Um, and I feel 
fine for the most part. I don't feel mm-hmm. tired and fatigued, but but I'm I'm curious. I don't know if that's the right amount of sleep or not not enough or too much. But um, and, and what, what yeah. time do you normally get? I usually get up between five and five thirty a.m. Okay. And then and then what's your typical routine from five thirty? So I wake up. I do. I drink about four or five ounces of milk just to kind of get some protein and nutrients in me right away. Uh, I drink a big glass. Well, usually I, I drink about another five, six ounces of water. And then I do a, a short workout. I do basically 12, 12, 12, uh, 12 sets of exercises, pull-ups, push-ups, different things like that, abs. And I do those pretty much right away. Um, and then I will do some meditation, maybe a little bit of journaling and I'll dive into just work. I'll jump on the computer and and, and start, you know, working on my podcast or my coaching products, et cetera. So that's kind of my morning routine. And then, and then, then, so, so, uh, and then I'll typically, what I've done really for the last couple of years, two, two and a half years is had a smoothie with spinach, broccoli, carrots, strawberries, blueberries, yogurt, kefir, um, peanut butter, chia seeds, flax seeds, banana. <laughs> so all packed into a smoothie at around yeah. seven, seven, seven o'clock. And, yeah. and then I'll, and then, so anyway, that's kind of how I start my, the last couple of weeks though, I've been drinking, uh, sort of a version of bulletproof coffee. I'll just have a coffee in the morning of the milk and the water and then coffee with butter in it. Um, and that, that, that fat and the butter is, is lasting me through. So I don't really eat until about 10 o'clock, but that's only been about five days. So anyway, okay. uh, I don't know how, okay. if that's a good or bad thing for me. Okay. And then, um, and then what time do you normally go to bed? Uh, between nine thirty and 10 o'clock. Okay, cool. And then, uh, do you do any more exercise through the day or is that, is that pretty much it then? That's most of my exercise, but usually about two or three days a week, I will do a longer workout, maybe run three miles and lift weights for 30 minutes, generally okay. speaking. I'll do that two or three mornings a week. Excellent. Okay, good. Right. Okay, so that's given me a good basis to go from. So on the in the, in the Fitness Dreams members area, um, okay. you'll see that uh, the very first page you come to is a page that's got a whole bunch of coaching tips on there, which are basically questions that I answer using your genetic information. But what we're going to do is we're just going to dig into some of the gene results, and I'll give you a bit more context on some of the gene results and how it relates to what you should be doing relative to what you are doing. Okay. So... Um, and for the for the so listeners, so I, I'm I'm logged into a website right now, and all you know. So the, he's going to kind of walk me through this and tell me you know how to decipher some of this, and he's going to do some of that for me. So just uh, just to give them a point of reference. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tr- I'm going to do this in a, I'm not going to do this in the order of the genes on the list. I'm going to do this in a slightly different order to actually answer the questions that you were asking. Um, uh, with regards to focus and productivity, because obviously it just gives more context to the listener. So the very first gene that we're going to look at is the gene called the clock gene. Okay, so I'm going to uh, click so view alphabetical- results. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, okay. yeah so, they're, so they're in alphabetical order. Okay. Now, the clock gene is a gene that's all to do with circadian rhythm. Um, so circadian rhythm is the, essentially the sleep-wake cycle. So, um, you know, gives information about the best time of the day to wake up, the best time of the day to go to bed, what you should be doing in terms of, you know, those hours. And the clock gene is, is an interesting uh, set of genes because actually last year there was three American scientists that got the Nobel Prize for their work on uh, the PER3 genes or the period genes, which are obviously all part of the, sort of the, the clock genes. And you have one copy of each of the gene variations here. Which so for, for the listener, I'm actually going to do a screencast, a little short video kind of walking you through the website a little bit so you're seeing what I, you can see what I'm seeing. And again, I'll have the link to that in the action plan at jimharshawjr.com slash action. So go ahead. So I've got, the, I've got two versions of the, the clock gene, so keep going. No, no, no. So, so, you've, got, so you've got one version of each of the genes okay. here, okay. Which, which, would, which would actually imply that you're somebody who – potentially should be doing a little bit the, the, the most the greatest percentage of your activity should probably occur a bit later in the day so for example you get up incredibly early but you might not necessarily biologically be suited to getting up early now one of the things that we tend to find is that um the way humans live our lives we, we live our lives based on 
set an alarm clock to get up to go to school, to get up to go to work, to get up to you know do all of these other things. Um, and we don't we don't necessarily do what our bodies would naturally want to do. So you know you hear people say. I'm completely an early bird, always have been. And then you hear other people say, "Oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a night owl. You know, no way I can get up, I can get up early." So there is this natural inbuilt mechanism that there are certain things that we are particularly suited to. Yeah, um, and I, I've and never reason- considered myself a morning person, really. Uh, I've only started doing this just a couple of years ago, um, the yeah. waking up early thing. Yeah, and 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 for you, I, I you know, from a genetic perspective, I wouldn't describe you as a morning person. Um, so for you, getting up incredibly early and working out at the time you're working out you know might not necessarily be um the best thing for you um and actually if i was to sort of put a time on when you should be working out i would probably say you should be exercising between midday and four in the afternoon if you want to get the absolute most out of your workout because my body is most prepared for working out at that time of day is that right Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's a time of the day that your body is less likely to be under massive amounts of, of stress. So uh, you know that, uh, so for example, when, when, we, when we wake up in the morning, uh, we wake up, whether we wake up in response to high levels of cortisol or whether we're in the process of waking up, cortisol levels go up. But what happens is cortisol levels go up and then obviously they start to come down again. Um, now, there are certain people who can actually trigger, um, well, there is a trigger for high levels of cortisol when we start to prepare for the day based on a planning process. But then when there's lots of external stresses that happen, that, that can drive our cortisol levels higher and higher and we can end up in a very stressed and horrible state. So it's all to do with the effects of cortisol that give us an ability to predict the best times of the day to work out. Now, given that we know that you're somebody who probably should be waking up a little bit later, so it's probably not five o'clock, probably more like seven, eight o'clock, uh, and that actually... You know, you'd want to be starting your daily routine then and then actually preparing for your workout, whether it's eating the right foods or whatever that might be, and then working out around about lunchtime or a little bit later in the afternoon. That's when your body is going to be in a state where as long as everything is right and as long as, you know, you've got no massive external stresses, when your body is going to respond better to the exercise, recover better from the exercise, and that you're going to get the most benefit from the exercise. Again, as long as everything else rings true. So um, so in terms of, you know, you're talking about focus and productivity. Well, it depends on what bit of the day that you're talking about there. But if you want a longer, more productive day, then I probably wouldn't be getting up that early and working out that early for you specifically. I'd probably, uh, so I'd actually, you know, look at completely um, uh, rejigging, rejigging that morning routine. So maybe work, uh, doing the work that I do from, say, five to seven or five thirty to seven AM, would that be better done shifting that hour and a half or that ninety minutes to from ten to eleven thirty PM? Uh so 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 probably probably what I would do for you is I would be waking up a bit later. Um and I mean do you do you do you tend to have do you, I mean do you have like a to do list? Do you know oh, yeah. exactly what you're you know you know exactly what you're doing through the day. Yes. Yeah. So I would just basically push the to-do list a little bit further forward in the day. Gotcha. Uh, and, and 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 I'm not saying that you necessarily need to work work to late to a later time, but it just might be that if you're getting up at a better time, um, you might be more productive in the hours that you are working, and therefore you don't necessarily need to push your working hours later. If gotcha. That makes sense. Okay. Um, now. Uh, if we if we stick to nutrition just to kick off, um, so one of the first genes um, on this list as well is a gene called the CYP1A2 gene, and this is a gene that's all to do with caffeine metabolism. So how fast do you break down caffeine, and therefore that influences potentially how much coffee you should drink and when you should drink coffee. Okay, what's this one called again? Uh, CYP1A2, CYP1A2. So you carry one copy of each of the genes here, which would imply that you're probably a slow metabolizer of caffeine. Um, Now, um, given that you have the clock gene variation that that you have, and given that you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, uh, there is a risk that um, caffeine or coffee intake for you could have an impact on the quality of your sleep, especially if you have caffeine too late in the day. Ah, interesting. So, um, So for you... I would only have caffeine in the morning and I wouldn't have too much caffeine. I wouldn't have too much coffee. 
Um, and actually, people who are slow metabolizers of caffeine um, probably shouldn't drink more than a couple of cups of coffee a day anyway, because um, there's been some very interesting research which has showed that people who suffer with heart disease, if they're slow metabolizers of caffeine and they drink too much coffee, actually the caffeine stays in their system for longer, stimulating smooth muscle in the blood vessels in the heart and actually can trigger heart attacks. So um, so actually as a slow metabolizer, I would just, from your perspective, I would make sure that you don't drink too much coffee and only have, one, say, one or two cups in the early part of the day. All right, fair enough. Cut back on my coffee in the afternoon. Yep, definitely. Uh, in fact, I would I would remove coffee from from your afternoon completely. Darn it! Not so sure I'm enjoying <laughs> this. <laughs> okay. Now the next thing, that, the next gene of interest is the APO2 gene. So if you go a bit further down, it's APO2. Yeah. So okay. um, one of the things that you mentioned is that you started to to use uh, or to have bulletproof coffee. Yeah. Um, which is coffee with, um, well, classically coffee with butter and some form of uh, medium chain triglycerides. Um, but you're somebody who actually is sensitive to saturated fats, meaning that if you consume too much saturated fat, um, there's a chance that you could, uh, it could potentially lead you to storing body fat. Mm. Um, so I would ensure that actually you're not getting I would make sure that, that you're not going too crazy with the consumption of saturated fat therefore butter in your coffee might not be the best thing for you darn it this is uh, you're ruining everything here oh my you gotta I gotta <laughs> reshift everything which is a good thing because at the end of this I'm gonna be more optimized all right so is exactly, there exactly so, so so I mean you know if, if you want to add you know, medium chain triglycerides to your coffee, then uh, then that's fine if, if you know if you want to do that. And and actually, it's the MCTs that, in a fasted state, have the effect of leading to the production of more ketone bodies that leads to potentially more focus anyway and, and potentially more energy. So, um, so that isn't necessarily a bad thing. But I would definitely, um, based on this stream variation, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be putting uh, butter in your coffee. No. All right. So I like the idea of the butter just making me feel full for longer. So, yeah. um, so I don't have to eat right away, which is fine. I'm not overweight or anything. I'm fine with my weight. Um, yeah. but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm 42 years old and, uh, I'm starting, you know, just that layer of like middle age fat is just kind of showing up there. I'm not like the ripped athlete that I used to be when I was in 22 yeah. years old, you know? Um, yeah. So, so how do we, so my suggestion? Well, my suggestion for you would be so if we scroll a little bit further down, there's a gene called UCP2. Well, actually, it's, it's further up. It's called um, UCP2. UCP, I see three, Two. and I see. Uh, so, so if you go all the way to the top, it's about the it's about the eighth or ninth gene down. Gotcha. UCP2. The gene for metabolism. Yeah. So this is all to do with metabolic efficiency. So, so you've heard you've heard when people say they've got a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism. Um, well, actually, what a fast metabolism is is it's an inefficient metabolism. It's inefficient because you eat lots of food and lots of calories, but you don't actually store the energy. So, I would imagine that you might be someone who would describe yourself as having a fast metabolism. Sure. Yeah. But actually, based on this gene variation, you actually have an inefficient metabolism. So it's it's not that it's fast, it's that it's inefficient. So um, so if you were, given that we're saying you're going to work out later in the day, and I'm going to talk you through exactly what the structure you work out should be, because it's different to what you're doing at the moment. So um, given that you should be working out later in the day, given that what we've said is that you should be um, uh, getting up a little bit later as well, then actually... Um, Rather, you might be a candidate for somebody who should follow um, sort of an intermittent fasting style protocol. So um, actually, you wake up in the morning and you know you can drink coffee. That's fine. Um, strictly speaking, you shouldn't be adding any MCTs. But if you do, well, okay. Um, but um, you would actually focus your eating on the later part of the day, and specifically even around your workout. Because if you want to get the most of you out of your workout, you need to make sure you've got energy. Uh, for the workout and energy to recover. And if you don't store energy particularly well uh, because you're metabolically inefficient or you have a fast metabolism, then it becomes important to make sure you are eating at least somewhere near the workout in order to get the most out of the workout. Now, 
if we then also add to that that you that you have a gene called the um, well, there's a gene called the PPAR gene, PPARA, and um, so it's just the one above UCP2. Got it. A uh, gene for fat burning. Yeah. So this is this this gene is all to do with how well you switch from burning carbohydrates to burning fat for energy. Um, and actually, because you carry one copy of each of the variations here, that would imply that. You don't, nece- you don't necessarily switch well from burning carbohydrates to burning fat. So if your focus is to make sure that your body is burning fat, uh, you're, and also you're working out effectively and you're making sure that you're, you, you know, you're focused through the day and your energy levels are all optimal and that sort of stuff. Um, actually, um, you should be slightly reducing your carbohydrate intake so you probably should be consuming a bit more protein and a little bit more fat, but obviously not saturated fat, probably more monounsaturated or polyunsaturated. Uh, bring your carbohydrates down a little bit um, and focus a lot of your food intake around your workout um, in an intermittent fasting style protocol. That's probably the way that you should be structuring your eating and structuring your diet with a little bit of coffee early in the day, which I know is, it sounds like it's completely different to what you're doing at the moment. Yeah, sure. So starting out my day with coffee, uh, not necessarily eating early, but eating closer to my workout, which should be yeah. more middle of the day or, or early afternoon. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then if you were doing, let's say if you were doing like a, a protocol, which was like, um, say like an intermittent fasting protocol, which is, which was 16 hours fasting, eight hours eating. Let's say that you were going to be working out at four in the afternoon you'd maybe have some food about two o'clock, two thirty. Um, and then you've got an eight hour window. So you would be potentially you could eat up until about ten o'clock, ten thirty, and then you'd be starting your fast again. And obviously you'd probably be in bed by then anyway. Right. And then you wouldn't eat again until sort of two o'clock the following day. So um so I think there's there's definitely there's definitely quite a few changes that you could be making to your diet which would have a direct impact on obviously how you feel and productivity and stuff like that. And um, and I would imagine probably that with a reduced co- caffeine intake and just having that one coffee early in the day, getting up a little bit later, you'll probably find that, um, you know, you, you, you remain incredibly focused for quite chunky periods of the day. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's flip to some of the exercise ones because there's a couple of interesting exercise ones sure. for you. So um, you, you said before that you do about 12 sets of, of exercises. Um, which for you is not enough. Um, if you look at your first two genes here, which is the ACE gene and the ACTN3 gene. Yep. Uh, and for the listener, they say uh, a gene for endurance and a gene for speed. So go ahead. Right. So the gene for endurance is all to do with how, how well your body utilizes oxygen. And actually, you carry one copy of each of the variations, which, uh, so, sorry, you carry, one, you carry two copies of the variation, which would imply that you utilize oxygen better and therefore, your volume of training should be quite a lot higher. Mm. Um, volume meaning sets and reps. Now, when you add into that the ACTN3 gene, which is a gene that's all to do with recovery, um, not only should you be doing lots of volume, but you also probably within the workout, your rest should be quite short and you should be exercising quite frequently. So just doing 12 sets of exercises probably is not enough for you and you should be doing more like sort of, you know, 22, 24 sets um, of, you know, fairly sort of significant um, training volume as well. Mm-hmm. But if you scroll down a bit further to a gene, which is the M for mother CT1 gene, which is a gene that's all to do with fatigue. A gene for fatigue, got it. Yep. So this is all to do with how well you clear lactate, lactate or lactic acid. Um, and actually you carry one copy of each of the genes here, which in a male means that you clear lactate more slowly. So um, that basically implies that um, lactate is likely to accumulate in you a lot faster. So for you, when you're doing your high volume training with quite short recovery, you also need to make sure that you're kind of performing exercises at a fairly reasonable pace quite quickly. Um, so you don't want to be spending too much time in the, in the eccentric phase of a muscle contraction, which is, um, you know, for example, if you were doing a biceps curl, it would be when you're actually lowering the weight down because there's actually less muscle fibers contracting in that phase and therefore there's even more lactic acid accumulating. So for you, it's high volume training, short recovery, 
frequently through the week and then making sure that when you actually perform the exercises, you're doing them at quite a quick pace. So it might be like, you know, a tempo of like one second down, one second up. So if you're doing press-ups, for example, or push-ups, you know, it's like a second down, a second up, a second down, a second up, as opposed to other people that might do two seconds down, four seconds, uh, sorry, four seconds down and two seconds up or four seconds down and one second up. So okay. actually, the, even, even the speed at which you're exercising will have an effect on uh, the, the overall results. So, okay, so does that mean that, um, that I need to work harder than, than a typical person to get the same results? Or, or how, do, how do I interpret that? Well, it's, it's, it's not necessarily working harder because your rate of perceived exertion should be the same. So it might be, for example, that some people uh, do low volume training with longer recovery. But the expectation is in, in, in the lifting phase that they're at least lifting to that same level of exertion. Um, you know, you can, only, you can only work out, you know, so hard. Um, but how hard you're working out should be, should be the same between two people. It's just it's in a different way. I see. Okay. It might feel it might feel different as opposed to comparing it to somebody else. If you compare it to what you've normally done, it's probably going to feel very different, and it's got it probably is going to feel a lot harder because at the moment you're not working out in the right way for you. So that's what will make it feel more difficult and more challenging. But then, you know, from a results perspective, you'll get much better results. Yeah. Okay. So pretty much, I'm doing everything the opposite of what I should be doing, right? <laughs> uh, potentially, you could potentially look at it that way, yeah. <laughs> but then, but then, to be fair, that's that's actually quite a good position to be yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. There's there's kind of so much that you can do with the information. Yeah, if I feel like I'm getting good results like this, uh, then you know, if I make some of these modifications, I, I can theoretically get a lot better results. Be more focused, exactly. Uh, be be more efficient, be more effective uh, in my workouts and my diet, etc. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that's kind of you know you know uh, uh, some some of the some of the interesting nutrition and workouts and you know some of the interesting things that pull from your results. Obviously, there's there's lots. I mean, there's a lot more information that you can read through. But sure, you know, in terms of some high level stuff, this is some pretty interesting high level stuff. So um, I'm, as I look at this, so I'm still into the gene for fatigue, and. For the listener, again, you can you can go to the action plan. I can show you exactly what I'm looking at here, and it's a it's a real nice, simple description of the results here. So it sounds like you can you know you, you can certainly break some of this down on your own um, and get a general idea of what we're talking about here. But uh, on, on the right hand side, Doctor Dan, there is a a pie chart, and is that oh, yeah. you know for example this one says the MCT1 genotypes globally so this tells yeah. me where i fit in sort of how i compare to the rest of the world sure. right absolutely so so for example you're in the 38% uh, it, 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 in terms yeah you're in the 38% of people that also have the this particular variation so yeah you can see you can see where you fit in all right anything else here that i should know that we should be looking at I mean, I think that there's some there's some of the most in, you know some of the high level ones. I mean, there's there's again there's there's tons more that you can that you you can sort of read through. It's quite, sure. Quite and how many list, how many are there I mean, here total? Uh, there is four, there's forty eight there's forty eight here at the moment. Um, but interestingly, you've actually been tested on our new system. So even though there's forty eight results here, you've actually been tested on a chip which is testing for seven hundred and fifty thousand SNPs. This is only forty eight of them. Wow. Um, and we're gradually releasing more and more over the sort of the next over the next year or so on, on the new system that we've built. Okay, and for the listener, there's one here. It's a gene for appetite, a gene for aerobic capacity, uh, a gene for eye color, for adrenaline signaling, um, on and on yeah. and on. Nerve activity, yeah. uh, response yeah. to regular growth, a gene for regular growth and development, uh, or gene for blood flow, et cetera, et cetera. So. This is just absolutely fascinating, and there's, uh, I think, a lot of listeners would get a lot out of of doing this for themselves and and looking into this. Again, I'll have the link in the action plan uh, of a video, sort of a screencast showing 
how you can, you know, just kind of showing you, you what some of my results look like. So, so what will be the next step, Dr. Dan, uh, for this? I mean, I, looking at some of these, I see a, a tab here for, for workout and tab for nutrition, et cetera. Are there plans already built into this for me? Yeah. Yeah. So, so what you can do is you can go to, um, all plans and you can see a long list of, um, of workout plans that are available, um, to follow depending on what your goals are. Um, and then if you, if you click on, um, active plans, you can actually see, uh, what plans that you currently have active. Um, so now you should be able to, uh, you should be able to act. Yeah. I mean, all the plans are open up to you. So for example, you could go on to, um, let's say build muscle and you could click hero, um, and you can start the hero plan. Um, and that'll basically take you through four weeks of workout geared towards the goal of building muscle. And then obviously, you know, you can track your progress um, through that through that period. Very cool. You can also, uh, if you click on nutrition, um, based on um, your various inputs in your lifestyle questionnaire and also uh, through your genetic results, we can give you an idea based on your goal that you've entered into the system, how many calories you could, should be consuming at week one um, and what that amounts to in terms of carbohydrates, proteins and fat and then over time how that should change so it, it is all here again for listeners it, it's fascinating to see everything the whole breakdown of not only your results but but suggested workouts just suggested nutrition etc so dr dan i got a question for you how accurate sure. really is this right how can how much should i really and truly base everything that i do and you know sort of you know for me it, it's a it would be a pretty serious restructuring of of my day and my life in order to, mm. to, to, to adapt to this. And yeah. um, if I'm going to do that, how, how, how do I know that this is absolutely the right thing for me? So I suppose there's, there's a couple of different answers. I mean, in terms of the, the genetic data, I mean, the accuracy of the genetic data is obviously, you know, ridiculously accurate. So, um, so, you know, it's a given that the, that the data is 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 accurate. So, in, so the question is about the interpretation of the data, right? And okay. I think that there's a couple of different answers to this. Obviously, you know, we've done a lot of research that guides the precision of the information that we give to people. Um, and I would say that generally, you know, that information in terms of accuracy is on a normal distribution. So, for the majority of people, it's going to be correct. But there will be outliers where it isn't. And, and unfortunately, that's just how life is. You know, most things occur on a normal distribution. Um, for the greatest majority of people, it's going to be incredibly accurate. Um, and there will be a few, uh, there'll be a small percentage of people where it just, where, you know, it, it perhaps it's, it, you know, other things are, are more accurate. And that's just how it is. I mean, you, you know, yeah. that's just how, it's how science is. It's how human, humans are. It's how performance how performance is and and you know anybody that has anything to do with human performance uh, if they ever say anything if they ever try and tell you that something is 100 percent accurate then you know immediately they're talking rubbish um so uh so, so i would say for the majority of people the information is 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 right um and but there will be some people where you know, maybe it's maybe maybe there are things that, that don't uh, ring completely true mm -hmm. but then what i would say to them is you know, most people get their information from magazines and books yeah. and Instagram. Facebook and, Instagram, and Twitter, right. Facebook and Twitter. So the point is, most of the information you're consuming when it comes to fitness is not based on any science whatsoever. Right. And what we're doing is we're giving you a layer of science. Oh, sorry, let me rephrase that. Um, depending on where you get the information from. Obviously, if your information is coming from incredibly experienced, fitness professionals and personal trainers then that's that's very different and, and and you know we work with very experienced fitness professionals and coaches and things like that because their information is amazing and obviously when you combine what we do with what they do it's, it's phenomenal but where you're getting your information from people who aren't qualified who, who aren't experienced and it's just based on you know because they look a certain way or something like that well then that's probably not the best information but yet a lot of people are consuming their information that way and taking action you know, based upon that. So yeah. on that basis, it, you know, this becomes uh, an incredibly uh, well-structured and predictive platform. Right. And I think the other interesting point is, is, you know, even if some of this information that we are consuming is based on science and based on research and based on data, 
it's mm-hmm. sort of generally and broadly applied across the entire populace of the country or the world, right? And yeah. this is yeah. this is taking information and data that is true to you, the the individual and and applying it to to your life and taking this sort of the information and knowledge that is out there and and combining mm-hmm. it with the information that is true about you as an individual and then and then optimizing optimizing your life based on that. Dr. Dan, where can people learn more about you, learn more about fitness genes, get their own genetic test done and in, can you even tell us about the some of the prices on this and and, and kind of how they can work with you? Sure, yeah. So um, you can go to fitnessgenes.com uh, and on fitnessgenes.com you can pick up your DNA analysis kit and you can also, if you want to select specific programs, workout plans, nutrition plans, anything like that, they're all available on there. The price of the DNA test starts at $199. And if people would like to learn a little bit more about fitness genes, um, you can go to all of our social media, which is at fitness genes for everything. Um, if specifically you want to talk to me or interact with me, then I'm at Dr. Dan Reardon, at Dr. Dan Reardon on everything as well, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and, um, and yeah, on, on YouTube, all of their typical social platforms. And, you know, we're always happy to answer anybody's questions and, you know, interact with people and, and work with people. Excellent. And for the listener, I will have links to everything that Dr. Dan just shared there. I'll have all those uh, links to his social media, to the website, et cetera, right in the action plan. Just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Dr. Dan, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating interview, especially because it was all about me and what I need to do for my (laughs) my own life. And for the listener, you can have that same experience for yourself. Uh, Again, grab the the copy of the action plan, jimharshawjr.com slash action, fitnessjeans.com. Dr. Dan, thank you for making time. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. Don't forget what I talked about before the interview. If you want to find balance, clarity, and focus, take the next step and go to jimharshawjr.com slash apply. Space on my calendar is very limited, so claim your spot now. jimharshawjr.com slash apply. Thank <laughs> you.